Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog, and I have another very special interview for you guys today, uh, much like with Ben Pronsky, who did the voice of uh, Eddie Brock and Venom on the Maximum Venom Marvel Spider-Man Season 3. I have today two of the head writers of the show who have been with the show since the beginning, I believe, have done a lot of other great stuff. We're going to dive into the work they've done before and their work here on Maximum Venom. Uh, Kevin Burke and Chris Dockwai, thank you guys so much for being here today. Thanks for, for having us, Zeke. Hey. Absolutely. <laughs> no problem. And uh, can I, where can people find you guys on social media? Like, what do you use? Twitter, Instagram? Uh, yeah, I mean, I use Twitter and Instagram. My, I am at Kevin Burke Twenty at both of those. Uh, Kevin Burke Twenty is my are my Instagram accounts where you'll just see a lot of uh, just pictures of the different shows. And then Twitter is also Kevin Burke Twenty, so that's easy to find at both medium. Awesome. And I'm on Twitter at uh, Otherland Seventy One. That's O T H E R L A N D. Seven one, Awesome. And everyone who's listening, I will have those links down in the description box so you can be one click away from following these guys and checking out all the great work that they do here on Maximum Venom with you know, Marvel's Spider-Man Season 3 and then also the other great work that they do, which we're going to talk about here very shortly. So, guys, it's a big pleasure. Um, ever since meeting at D23 last year, I can't believe, like you know, Kevin was saying before we started recording, that it's been almost like 10 months since we've officially met in, in face-to-face. And I, I, I'm a huge fan of you guys, and it means a lot to me that you uh, even took interest and notice in our, our little show here and, uh, and that you were willing to take time out of your day to be here. So once again, thank you very much. We're excited oh. to be here. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, so we'll dive right into my questions. Uh, first up, uh, you know, you both have written some really great television shows in the past and currently, obviously. You've done stuff that I love, like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Transformers Cyberverse, Ninjago, Batman Unlimited, Star Wars Resistance, to name a few. Uh, but what were some of the defining cartoons and comics that you feel led to your career paths as, uh, you know, as where you are now? Um, I can start. Uh, I mean, generally as a kid, you know, G.I. Joe Transformers were, were big, um, and they were on all the time, and, and it, that definitely led to toy um, playing. Same with the first Turtles series. But um, the series that really sort of changed the way I saw animation, that really defined what what we do and what, what I try to do, was, was Robotech, when Robotech was on. And then um, I saw Akira in the theater. In, ni- in 1990, it came out in the theater, and that was one of those... Uh, experiences where I walked out of that theater a different person than I went into that theater, right? It showed me this sort of complexity that um, animation could have. We, you know, I've been a lifelong comic book fan and loved the complexity of stories in comic books and the art in comic books and was always a little bit frustrated that animation at that time couldn't really hit that level of art, right? That level of storytelling. Um, that has changed, you know, in recent years. And, and I think that that... Um, the sort of uh, strengths that we see in animation, you know, come out of a lot of comic book storytelling. And we we are really, those are the inspiring things to me, the combination of reading and seeing these series on television brought us probably to where we are today. Nice. Absolutely. And for me, I will throw all of those same answers and I will throw in also Star Blazers um, because for, for Star Blazers was the first sort of serialized uh at show the cartoon that I had watched, you know, like I, as much as I loved Transformers G One and other shows, suddenly Star Blazers sort of locked me into this long epic arc of an adventure um, and that had real stakes, um, you know, and that sort of slowly grew and uh, you know that that sort of changed the way I looked at what animation could do as a kid. That's- yeah, I mean, it, Robotech was similar in that I, I came for the transforming robots and I stuck around for the <laughs> complex love triangle and people dying and things like that, you know, like that. That is, uh, there's certain life changers you see whenever, you, whenever you're watching animation. Amen. I, I was the same way too. Robotech got me, that was like a gateway into me getting into other things, but um, mainly it was Macross and things like that that really... Yeah started to, to hit me in the head with, hey, look, there's real things and real stakes and real relationships here. Um, and uh, that's great. That's great to hear. Um, and I can it, it shows, like, I can tell, like, when I watch people's stuff and when I kind of hear their voices through characters and, uh, and the different voices that you guys give to characters, that always shows me the breadth of stuff you must have had inspiring you growing up. So hearing all that is great. And I think that explains why I like a lot of your writing, both of you. Um, so when when writing a show that's aimed at a younger audience, like uh, but knowing that older fans like me will probably also be watching it, is there a balance that you try to hit, or is it uh, story and character first without too much thought on the age group watching? Like you know, how do you kind of you know how, how does your mind work when it comes to those kind of elements in there? 
Well, st- story and character definitely do come first, but we try to always keep the audience in mind. Um, these very much are shows for kids, and we don't ever want to alienate the kids or or not you know uh, not speak to our audience. That said, I mean we're adult fans, and we we absolutely want the adult fans to enjoy the show. Um, uh, and so we 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 really hope adult fans will sit with their kids uh, if they have them and and watch these shows together but we we always try to keep the kids in mind it is about the kids uh, at, uh, you know for our show and and watching and that, that question is is the real question because what we do is so strange in that we are making a series you know a brand new series and, and this is the second spider-man series we worked on that is appealing to its target disney channel audience but also is ostensibly you know has decades worth of audience that still watch it Right, like when there were new versions of shows, say in the '80s, you know, your parents didn't watch cartoons anymore. That's not how we live now, right? We we have to recognize, you know, we have a lot of people watching these simultaneously, and um, and that has been the question, sort of, especially with Spider-Man, because Peter Parker is is supposed to be sort of the evergreen teenager. He's been in animation for 50 years now, and if you watch him in like Spider-Man '67. And he's a teenager, but he's wearing a suit. You know what I mean? He's got a close cropped haircut. Like the idea of being a teenager meant something different in 1967 than what it means today. Right. And so we have to keep that in mind. This whole idea that any kid or teenager who watches Spider-Man, whether it's the cartoon show, whether it's the movies, at any time period sees themselves. Do you know what I mean? You don't want to watch it and be like, "Oh, that must have been what a teenager was like for my parents." You want to watch it and you want to see me. You know what I mean? You want to watch it and say, that's that's me on it. And everyone who's a fan of Spider-Man typically oftentimes picks the eras in which Peter Parker reminded them the most of themselves, no matter what that era might have been. Yeah, I mean, I, I grew up with Spider-Man as Amazing Friends, and uh, and so I uh, I definitely was like, yeah, that's what I want to do one day. I want to live with my, my best friend who's a mutant, and I want to live with uh, you know our, our other friend who who uh, she kicks a lot of butt. So, um. <laughs> uh, you know, apartment that that sort of transforms into a secret headquarters, right? Which is which I still want, right? And, and I do have to wonder whoever lived below that apartment had like a coffee table that came into the ceiling every once in a while. <laughs> that, <laughs> that, uh, yeah, it turned into a computer, and they're like, "What is going on upstairs?" But uh, that, that yeah, that was super cool. I, uh, that's what, you know, it's funny you said that, because I always imagined I was the person who lived underneath them, and I was just like, whoa, cool, what's what's, what's what's happening <laughs> yeah. to the ceiling? And then you, you never go upstairs to see what they're doing, you're just like, oh, it must be something. I'm yeah, I'm, I'm like, like, I don't know. Also, so, <laughs> if it weren't for that series, we'd, we'd never have Ms. Lyon. Ms. Lyon was, uh, right. came for that show. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Now, that, that show was, I was young when I was, when I was out, and that was sort of a gateway to Spider-Man. That was, that was like, oh, wow, you know, I mean, this is, this is, this was the modern version of Spider-Man. Um. And, and uh, you know, it's funny now because it's so many generations of Spider-Man, but, but yeah, there was a time where that was extremely relevant. Yeah, I, I watched that later, in, like after it came out, but uh, it was around the late 80s when I saw that cartoon, and that was my first introduction to Spider-Man. And then my mom went and picked me up a comic book, and that comic book was Craven's Last Hunt, which is vastly different. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's some whiplash right there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's, some, there's some tonal shifts in that, yes. <laughs> yes. And wow, that's incredible. Yeah, so so yeah, oh, I love Spider-Man. Um, so my third question then is, uh, not only do you both write, uh, but you also produce, and Doc, I think I saw you listed as a producer for Napoleon Dynamite is that correct yes um, which is a movie I love by the way I love that movie so much and uh, so Thank what you. what are the few of what are a few because I know there's many roles producers uh, have on on you know shows like this but what are some just like a couple of the roles that a producer has on a show like Marvel spider-man because I, one thing I try to do is educate my audience on and myself on how things are made and a lot of times people do ask me this like hey what does a producer do so just out of curiosity what are some of the things you guys do as producers well, we are creative producers on Spider-Man, meaning we don't deal with budgets and we don't deal with deliverables or, or other things like that. We only produce from a creative perspective. Okay. Um, so like when I produce Napoleon Dynamite or, or other indie films, I'm very much in charge of the budget, which is usually tiny, uh, you know, because a lot of independent films are on a shoestring budget. Napoleon certainly was. And you're watching every penny that gets spent and you're getting to do some fun creative work in terms of working with a director and developing the script, but uh, there's a lot of logistics and there's a lot of uh, business and there's a lot that's also not creative, but the, but the business 
of of getting you know the transpo department to the right place at the right time um for us on spider-man the kind of producing we do is purely creative we don't handle the budget anyway we don't um you know deal with with crew um issues or any of the other things that the um studio executives deal with um we are uh you know once we produce uh in the sense that once we deliver the script we don't just hand it off and walk away um we're involved in the animatic reviews we're involved in the scoring uh we uh do notes we do adr sessions um uh, meaning sort of as the animation comes back we're working on changing the dialogue to work with the animation that comes back from overseas. Um, and, uh, you know, all the other duties that happen throughout post-production until delivery uh, to to the network, but only from a creative perspective. And, and prior to that, we get, like, auditions of, of actors. In fact, like, mm-hmm. we, we're the, we're, we put in our vote for Ben to, for playing Eddie and, and uh, Venom. Do you know what I mean? So the, the, the producing aspect is great on this show because you know there there's a lot of moving parts it's it's marvel and so we get to focus on the stuff that ends up on the screen mostly do you know what i mean we don't right. have to deal with a lot of the ground stuff um so that's what a lot of the producing is on other shows you know that aren't, aren't in marvel yeah we do have to deal with some other things um you know scheduling things and budget things um but but for spider-man we get to really pretty much focus on following this product from the inception to the final product and then when we're doing ADR like it's the last thing we do before it hits the air and we're there up until the sort of the moment it airs so that's part of the producing and then anytime there's anything creative that they have to ask like hey guys will this line work or we can't we can't bring in this actor they're not available how can we change that you know there's certain things that we have to address from the producing standpoint that way we sit for example in the record sessions next to the voice director whose name is Colette Sunderman Mm -hmm. she's fantastic and we've worked with her on other shows of ours like Stretch Armstrong and um the Avengers uh, Assemble show uh, that we we were head writers for and you know we'll sit with her and and work with her on what the best takes are and how to you know sometimes we'll be swapping lines in during a record section if something feels like it's not working uh you know uh, with the actors and that kind of thing and we'll be over the sh- over the shoulder directing, which which she loves. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a lot there's a lot goes to it because yeah, we we do get a say in in how these scripts get turned into into episodes. The writers we hire, for instance, you know, four episodes, they turn in the script and they don't they don't really see it till it airs. You know what I mean? But but us being producers, we follow it all the way through to the end. Ah, that's awesome. Well, yeah, and yeah, I know. I, I, that's one of the questions I get asked a lot: is what do producers do? I'm like, well, which type of producer? Because there's like you know 40 <laughs> different types. Um, so, uh, so no, thank you for clarifying that. And uh, also, you know, with the concept of Maximum Venom being the third season storyline, you know, how did that come about when you were planning the story? Like, all right, we're coming up to season three. Um, one, did you know it was going to be your you know last season, or do you know now if it's going to be the last season? And what made you want to go with symbiotes for the final season well i can say this the way that marvel has typically done it marvel animation the first two seasons seem to establish the show right if you see the history of other shows avengers um you know was avengers assemble for two seasons then it became um the ultron revolution right. season spider-man became web warriors mm-hmm. all of spider-man became web warriors then it became um versus the sinister six so it was the third season of Marvel Spider-Man, so it was time to find like, an overreaching storyline. Um, and from what we were, you know, we're told from Marvel New York, like Venom is still hu- Venom is always huge. Venom is sort of like the evergreen idea. Kids of all ages love Venom. Venom's obviously loved by adults. I, I mean, obviously, Ven- Venom came out in '88, I believe. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm just remembering Spider-Man 300 when I when I bought that, and uh, it. It's obviously, I mean, not counting Carnage, which is, you know, comes off of Venom. You know, it's clearly the most important Spider-Man villain or even Spider-Man characters, you know, since the original Rogues Gallery, right, back in the 60s and in the 70s. And uh, and so this is, everyone loves this. There's really no downside to doing Venom, you know what I mean, as a, as a, as a draw. Everybody loves Venom. Everybody wants to see more Venom. They kind of can't get enough of Venom. Right. Oh, yeah, that makes yeah. sense. 
it's yeah. like it's like doing yeah. Joker for Batman. It's like, uh, but the right. but like you said, Venom. He's only like a thirty year old character. To to see see him hit that level where he's this household name. It's like that. We talk about that all the time on the show when people ask me. How do you do 500 episodes of a character like Venom? I'm like, are you kidding me? Everybody loves Venom, dude. <laughs> so that's great. Yeah, yeah. There's something about. I mean, it is. There's a visceral quality to Venom. There's a complexity to Venom. There's. I mean, it got, even in the 90s, it was clear how quickly Venom became a massive character. Um, there's an iconography to Venom. The it, the black costume originally is why I picked up Spider-Man. Right. Go, mm-hmm. Going back to finding the teenager version of Peter Parker that you relate to. When that black costume showed up in, in 252, that's when I got interested in, in the comics because I felt like, oh, they're making a Spider-Man for me, like for, for kids like me. Yeah. And the previous Spider-Man would be for the previous generation of people. So I was already drawn in from that image of Spider-Man in the black costume. And so Venom just takes that one step further. And it is obviously timeless. Like it is definitely, it keeps growing. Do you know what I mean? Like people want more and more Venom on the toy side, on the story side, on the comic side. I mean, we, we're getting some of the most complex and biggest Venom stories we've ever gotten in recent years. And uh, so it doesn't seem like it's slowing down at any time. If we could just get apartments or cars to be shaped like Venom, I would be very happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think mean, everyone secretly wishes their clothes could just come on and off like Venom. Like, yeah. there's, a, there's, a, there's a wish fulfillment to Venom. Everyone also would love you know, to be able to have great fangs and rage at things when they, when they get angry about stuff. No, Venom? Venom, I mean, he's he's a villain, but he's also very much like you know an anti-hero in the way Wolverine was to some extent, and uh, Wolverine is is evergreen in that sense too. You know, there's something iconic and cool about this guy, and Venom hits a lot of those same notes. Nice. I, oh yeah. Obvi- obviously, I agree. Otherwise, I'd be doing a Prowler show. Um, <laughs> who, who I do love, Prowler, by the way. Um, yeah. My next question is: so the show is, you know, obviously given us. A uh, fairly familiar take on Venom with the last season and season two, uh, but a slightly newer take on the Venom symbiote in some regards. How much work goes into you know picking and, and you know and kind of filtering out which which you're going to do that might appease fans and what you're doing for interpretation sakes? Like how are those elements all kind of pulled together with you guys, and how do you how do you discern them to do what's what's best? It, obviously, I guess story might lead you, but I'm just curious. Well, that, that, I mean, it's probably the biggest issue that we deal with in the writers' rooms because we we love Spider Man. We grew up reading Spider Man. We, um, you know, absolutely want to honor those great stories that we grew up with, but we also just don't don't want to just regurgitate them and just you know, uh, you know, here's a motion comic from you know something JM wrote in '88. You right. know what I mean? We want them to be new and fresh and original. We um, you know, we want to find ways to present these stories to kids today in fresh and original ways. Um, you know, we did do a fairly familiar take on Eddie, and the reason we did that is because, first of all, we think Eddie is just really strong. It's just the diametric opposite of Peter, and the idea that, um, you know, that, that sort of Eddie sort of has this rivalry with Peter, and the symbiote, you know, sort of hates Spider Man, so it's the two sides. Of, of Peter Spider-Man that the two, you know, um, sides of Venom hate. And, and when they're brought together, they sort of hate the whole of Spider-Man. We sort of love that. And Eddie had been off screen in, in animation for so long that presenting a very, like, classic Eddie um, seemed, uh, you know, like something that our, our kids wouldn't have seen, you know. Right. Because when we did Spider-Man, we did Agent Venom, right? We did Flash's Agent Venom. So, so the original Eddie Venom hadn't been seen in a while, to Doc's point. He had not, that origin might not have been known to a new generation. True. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, yeah, it wasn't, what was it? Spectacular Spider-Man, I think, was the last time we saw Eddie. And even that was the ultimate version of Eddie where he was like a scientist uh, assistant. Yeah, yeah, you're right. That was that was he was someone that you know uh, he was not a reporter. He was not someone that was in competition directly with Peter at the, the Daily Bugle. We wanted to we wanted to lean into that. That's the venom that we did. So yeah, to Doc's point, I mean that this is the question we have all the time. And sometimes these original stories actually haven't been told. So sometimes you get to tell them the way they were originally set up, and that's always a lot of fun because no one has has translated them. Like when we did um, Superior Spider Man in season two, that's never been an animation. So we got to do that in a way that had, there was no precedent for that um, but when we come to this yeah it's about finding new ways to, to tell Venom stories that, that aren't predictable uh, we don't want to go out of our way to just be unpredictable you know you never want to just circumvent expectations because then you end up going in, in a weird directions 
We want to keep it fresh. You know, if, if you love Venom, you want to watch it and not just be seeing what you've seen before. You want to see new stuff that captures what you originally loved about this character. Yeah, amen. And so, so with that being said, like, um, you know, you guys have been on this show since season one of Marvel Spider-Man. So when planning out that season and bringing in elements like the V-252, which is, you know, what we know the symbiote as, um, did you think that that would, or hope, that that would one day lead to a bigger symbiote-related story, or did things just kind of happenstance move in that direction? Well, that was Kevin Shinnick, uh, Shinnick who was a producer in season one, mm-hmm. um, uh, sort of helped develop the show, um, or develop the show with Steve Wacker, the executive um and he but th- there was very much the idea i mean we didn't know that it two years later would be breaking you know six one hour venom specials but there very much was the idea of let's introduce it in a small way so that symbiotes can grow to become a bigger part of the show later on so okay. it, it, you know not specifically but definitely with the idea of, of planting something small and letting it grow and that's one of the original great things about the way that Venom showed up in comics. I mean, it's a good five years, four or five years before, you know, the symbiote from Secret Wars turns into Venom, right? There is time for this to, to grow. The difficulty in all the Spider-Man shows is that no one's been able to do the actual origin of of the black costume because, because there's never been a Secret Wars, right? Spider-Man's mm-hmm. never been to space to try to do this thing. So, so in season one, we're trying to find a way to get it to, get it to Earth, to get it in this, you know, in this Peter's life in a way we haven't seen before and without having to go to space and that's always a challenge and that's why there's a number of different ways they've done it yeah that's true yeah and it's you're right because even in the animated series in the 90s we had the alien symbiote costume first and then they did a secret wars type story in like season four or five um but that was like right. way, way after so yeah you're right we never really got that um so, you know, uh, luckily me, like, you know, building this community of Venom fans, I, I've been very fortunate to see a lot of aspiring artists that have kind of gravitated to the show, obviously, because Venom has that appeal to, to artists and stuff. And so there are people like Lonely Symbiote and John and Kiana who do, like, channel art for me. Um, you know, I'm very lucky to have a lot of these artists, fans out there and, and viewers who watch the show. So for them, I would like to ask a question for, for people who are into that uh, process. You know, how many drawings typically are done for characters like Venom before you have to pick one, and who gets to vote on that final choice? Well, undoubtedly, they do hundreds and hundreds. Um, we, the production team, sort of curates those, and only only certain ones advance to us, um, you know, to take a look at. Uh, but when you are um, working on a Marvel series, uh, the Marvel executives and the Marvel team they'll get final say on what what every character is going to look like. Um, there's a brand team in New York that will weigh in on everything. And so th- there's very much, uh, you know, Marvel very much has a sense of wanting to, um, you know, protect and present these characters in, in a way that they care about. And so they're going to be the, the final voices, but they're very good about, you know, talking to us and letting us confer and, you know, and, um, and give our producer opinions on them. Yeah, and, and there and there's a lot of moving parts. Meaning, it's not just about what can be animated, what looks great for the show. There's also what what the toy component's going to look like, what all these other things. You know, how will this work in other other you know um, consumer sort of properties? Um, but Marvel is easier than some other shows where where you're coming up with all the characters from scratch. Like like at least in any Marvel show, you've got hundreds of issues of essentially development right, right? like right. no one had to sit and, and show us like 15 different extreme variations on how venom would look we know how venom's gonna look like he's gonna be he's gonna be you know black with the eyes and the teeth and the and the <laughs> just how he how he's sort of top heavy right we, we know that's the venom design the question is how does that design fit into the style of this show so it's a little easier for marvel shows um some other series we've done where everything is from scratch you do end up throwing a ton of ideas out and none of them get any traction because you're inventing this from from nothing you know marvel at least has tried some terrible costumes on characters that we know don't work and we don't have to follow <laughs> <laughs> right yeah they've they've already done most of the legwork right and so you got to yeah, yeah you got a solid foundation yeah, yeah. yes 
Hey everyone, thanks so much for listening to the first part of our interview with Kevin Burke and Doc Wyatt. Uh, I have more of that to come. I just wanted to break it up so I didn't deliver like a full 50 minute to one hour episode on you guys at once. I've been getting a lot of feedback about that recently. I mentioned that in recent videos and I do like this format of breaking things that run longer than 45 minutes, breaking them in half and doing one and two part episodes. So I hope you guys are enjoying it. I hope you liked what we have so far and we get into some really cool stuff in the next part. So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out and I'll have that episode up very soon. Thanks so much and don't don't forget to watch Maximum Venom this weekend on June 21st at 9 p.m. on Disney XD. Check it out. Check out the work of J.M. DeMattis. Uh, see Mark Spector come to life as Moon Knight for the you know first time in a while since we've seen him on anything animated, and uh, I think maybe even ever. I don't know. I'm not. I'm, I love the character, but I haven't you know dipped into him outside of uh, you know comic books too much. Except maybe I've seen him in a few video games. So seeing him here is going to be awesome. I can't wait. So make sure you don't miss out on this exciting episode. And we'll see you back here for part two of my interview with Doc Wyatt and Kevin Burke.